Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to discuss what you need to know about Paget's disease of bone, including epidemiology and etiology, pathogenesis, signs and symptoms, and we're also going to discuss how we can diagnose and how we treat Paget's disease of bone. So Paget's disease of bone, or PDB, is also known as osteitis deformans. It is a metabolic disease that involves increased bone destruction and remodeling. We're gonna get into a lot of details as to how this happens in the next couple of slides. Due to this increased turnover and destruction of bone, we can see skeletal deformities and there are certain parts of the body that are affected more than others and we're gonna talk about that as well. And you can see in this image, this gentleman's legs are deformed. Now, Paget's disease of bone is a condition of older adulthood. Its onset occurs in older adults, typically over the age of 55. And it's a relatively common condition. Around 2 to 9% or 2 to 10% of older patients can have this condition. It is the second most common bone disease in the elderly. Only second to osteoporosis. And we talked about this before, the prevalence of this condition increases with increasing age. And it has an increased prevalence in people of European descent. And this seems to be an ancient condition. There are skeletons of Neanderthals that show characteristic signs of Paget's disease of bone. So again, very common and seems to be more common in European descent individuals and people that are older. What is the etiology of this condition? The etiology is actually not entirely clear. We have a couple of theories. One of them is that there's a genetic predisposition. What has been found is that there seems to be mutations in SQSTM1 or sequestosome 1. This is a gene that encodes the protein P62 that's involved in macroautophagy. And there have actually been greater than 20 mutations identified in SQSTM1 or sequestosome 1 that are associated with an onset of Paget's disease of bone. And what we do find is that mutations in this gene, SQSTM1, lead to an increased formation of osteoclasts and it seems to be due to upregulated activity of NF-kappa B signaling. Now, the mutation in this gene is responsible for what we call familial Paget's disease of bone. Familial Paget's disease of bone is an autosomal dominant condition, which means that if a patient has Paget's disease of bone and it's a familial type, one of their parents must have had Paget's disease of bone as well. And this is in contrast to what we call spontaneous or sporadic Paget's disease of bone, where an individual with Paget's disease of bone doesn't have a family history of it. They just have had a spontaneous or sporadic mutation. So that is the difference here. So those are the two types of Paget's disease of bone. They present similarly, but they just have a different etiology or a different suspected etiology. There's also this theory of is Paget's disease of bone due to an indolent or a slowly progressive viral infection of osteoclasts. And what is believed to happen is that these paramyxoviruses like a measles virus infects the osteoclasts and increases their activity or the expression of aberrant osteoclasts. So again, this is a theory. There's some evidence to support this, but we still don't have a clear picture yet. So what is the pathophysiology of this condition? We talked about this before. This condition occurs in the skeleton of the elderly. It occurs in the aging skeleton. So if we look at a skeleton, there's particular areas that are affected by this condition. The skull is affected, the lumbar vertebrae, the pelvis, the femur, and the tibia. These are the common areas that are affected in Paget's disease of bone. And what we do find is that there's increased osteoclastic activity, as we mentioned before. There's an accelerated rate of bone remodeling, and there's osteoblast activity increases to compensate for the increased osteoclastic activity. So we'll get a bit into more detail here. So there are four phases of Paget's disease of bone. The first one is the primarily osteoclastic activity phase, or it's the osteolytic phase. So osteoclasts are cells that are responsible for dissolving bone. They are multinucleated cells. They have anywhere from five to 20 nuclei, and they release lysosomal enzymes and hydrochloric acid to dissolve the bony structure. So phase one is primarily osteoclastic activity. Phase two is a mix of both osteoclasts and osteoblastic activity. So as the osteoclasts clear the bone, osteoblasts, and you can remember osteoblasts, the B in osteoblasts, B for building, osteoblasts build 
bone, the osteoblasts come in and start to fill in the areas of the bone where the osteoclasts had dissolved. So the osteoblasts become activated and they start to build bone. So phase two is a mix. So this phase has both osteoclastic and osteoblastic activity. It's the mixed phase. In phase three, it's primarily osteoblastic activity. So the osteoclasts have done their job. The osteoblasts come in to fill in the bone. This is the osteosclerotic phase. So there are many cellular signaling pathways involved with rank L and rank and osteoprotedrin or OPG. So if you want to learn more about that pathway, please check out my lesson on that topic. But nonetheless, when we have lots of osteoclastic activity, the osteoclasts clear the bone, osteoblasts come in and build the bone again. And this is the cycle that becomes in excess in this condition. And eventually, some cases will lead to phase four. And phase four is when there's so much of this, there's a lot of building of bone and a lot of remodeling. There's actually a malignant degeneration of this process and we can get malignancy occurring from this in phase four. We'll talk about the malignancy in the next couple of slides. What are clinical features of Paget's disease of bone? Actually, the majority are asymptomatic, no symptoms at all. And this occurs in about 75% of all patients with this condition. When they do present, they present with oftentimes severe bone pain in areas where we talked about before, but more specifically in the pelvis, the femur, and the tibia. There are other skeletal abnormalities that we can see with this disease as well. One of them is bowed tibia. So we showed that image of the older gentleman earlier where his legs were bowed. But you can see here in this image, this individual has a left bowed tibia. Individuals with this condition can also have arthritis or inflammation of their joints, and they can have erythema or warmth over the bones that are being remodeled. So there's so much activity in those areas. There's lots of osteoclastic activity, then there's a lot of osteoblastic activity. Then they get hypervascularization of those areas of the bone. That area of the bone becomes very warm and even can show some reddening over the surface, and that can be a sign as well. There are also some skull abnormalities as well. We talked about the skull being affected by this condition. We can see an enlarged skull. So osteoblasts build a lot of bone in the skull and they get an enlarged skull. And we get something called lion-shaped face. And this is called leontiasis. So leontiasis is a lion-shaped face. It's due to Paget's disease affecting the skull. And what happens is the osteoblasts remodel and build the bone so much that it essentially reshapes the skull into looking like this, leontiasis. With all of this, all of this bony activity in the skull, patients can present with headaches and migraines, and they can be new onset of headaches and migraines in an older patient may be a clue that this could be the condition. What are some complications of this condition? There's increased risk of the following. There's increased risk of bone fracture. So because of that clearing of bone and remodeling of bone continuously, the bone's not as strong as it should be, and it can be easily fractured. We talked about this before. That malignant degeneration in phase four of this condition, if it's not dealt with, it can lead to Paget's sarcoma. So Paget's sarcoma is when there's so much building and remodeling and building it can actually become cancerous and malignant. This is Paget's sarcoma. With regards to the skull, if the skull becomes overgrown and there's too much building of bone of the skull, it can actually impinge on some cranial nerves. And some of them we see are the optic nerve. So we can see here, here's the optic nerve here. And you can imagine if this bone here surrounding the optic nerve starts to grow and grow in toward the optic nerve, it can impinge this optic nerve, they could lose some sight. And the other nerve that can be commonly affected is the auditory nerve. So cranial nerve neuropathies or cranial neuropathies can be symptom of Paget's disease of bone. And high output heart failure can be a complication of this condition as well. Why does that happen? Well, we talked about this before. When there's a lot of building of bone, there can be hypervascularization. New blood vessels form in the area of the bony activity. When there's more blood vessels in those areas, the heart has to pump more blood to those areas. And if this is not dealt with 
properly, there can be multiple areas of the body where there's hypervascularization. So there can be more blood vessels in different parts of the body that aren't supposed to be there. So the heart has a hard time keeping up with that. It has to pump more blood to those areas to fill those blood vessels. So it can go into failure because of all of that high output it has to deal with. So it's a high demand for the heart. What are some of the lab findings of this condition? One of them is increased alkaline phosphatase levels. So alkaline phosphatase can be found in bone, but can also be found in the biliary tree. The way we can distinguish this is by looking at a GGT. And the gamma glutaryl transferase comes from the biliary tree. So if it's Paget's disease of bone, the alkaline phosphatase comes from the bone itself. It doesn't come from the biliary tree. So the GGT is normal. We can also see increased urinary hydroxyproline. Hydroxyproline comes from bony matrices. So because it's, there's a lot of turnover, we can actually, if we were to measure the urinary hydroxyproline, we'd see elevated levels. And another important finding in Paget's disease of bone is that usually serum calcium levels are normal. Sometimes they can be elevated, but most of the time they're normal. The calcium can be elevated in certain circumstances. If the patient with Paget's disease is immobile or they're on bed rest or they're not active, they can have elevated calcium levels. There can be more osteoclastic activity due to the immobility. You might think of this as a hypercalcemia of immobility. So again, most of the time, calcium levels are normal in this condition, but they can be elevated in cases of immobility. How do we diagnose and how do we treat this condition? Diagnosis of Paget's disease can be aided by looking at alkaline phosphatase levels. So alkaline phosphatase levels are increased and they come from the bone. So there's no GGT, so GDT is normal. But we also would like to look at radiographic imaging, so X-ray findings. The X-ray findings demonstrate characteristic findings. And these include deformities of the bone, thickened cortices, tunneling of the bone, enlarged and dense bones. So you can see in this image here, this area is more dense than this area over here. So once we make the diagnosis, how do we treat it? Treatment of patch disease of bone includes treating the symptoms. So when we want pain control, we can use ibuprofen or other non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or we can use acetaminophen. Exercising can also help, but we have to be cautious here. We don't want to do too much physical activity because of that increased risk of bone fractures. So some possibly mild weight-bearing activities could help. We also want to supplement them with calcium and vitamin D. This prevents secondary hyperparathyroidism. And what's key to the treatment of Paget's disease of bone is the bisphosphonates. So you can think of alendronate or resedronate. So the drugs with the suffix dronate are the bisphosphonates. And second line treatment is calcitonin. Calcitonin tones the bones. So calcitonin can help prevent some of that remodeling from occurring, although bisphosphonates are the first line treatment. So if you want to learn more about other medical conditions, please check out my channel. It has many lessons on a variety of medical topics. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. And as always, continue to live, laugh, and learn, and I hope to see you next time.